Hi everyone, my name is Sarah O'Keefe and I'm here to talk to you about the future of publishing once again. And this time I want to talk to you about content as a service. So a couple of quick things here. What is content as a service? How can I use it? What are the challenges that we're facing? And what's this thing going to look like going forward? My name is Sarah O'Keefe. I'm the CEO of Scriptorium, which was founded 25 years ago in 1997. We address interesting technical challenges around product and technical content. How do we combine content and publishing to improve the business value of the content that we're delivering to our end customers, improve the customer experience and all that other good stuff. We do a ton of XML and Ditto work. We work with CCMSs, uh, especially including AEM guides. And I'm delighted to be here with you today. My team is distributed and based largely out of North Carolina in the United States. So first off, what is content as a service, right? Uh, content as a service means that you are going to produce content on demand. So instead of packaging content up into a PDF or even a static HTML site, we're going to wait until the client comes along, the customer comes along and says, hey, I need something specific. And at that point, we are going to deliver it to them exactly what they asked for. Uh, content as a service means that we are going to need to store information in some sort of a format neutral approach. Uh, this is the Ditto world event. So for those of you that are familiar with Ditto, that is in fact an XML format neutral approach. With content as a service, we're typically talking about something that is compatible with API delivery of some sort. And we're going to defer the actual formatting, rendering it into HTML or PDF or whatever it may be that the end customer wants until much later in the process than we're actually accustomed to. And I do believe that what we're dealing here with here is the future of publishing. And I know, especially for those of you that have heard me speak before, you're sitting here thinking oh, again with the future of publishing. And my answer is in fact, I'm sorry, but yes. So let's talk a little bit about why I think that is the case. I want to start with traditional publishing, right? And traditional publishing looks something like this. You author the content, you go through some sort of a production process a, and also a distribution process. And then the end user gets your content in a nice shiny package, whether a book or a website or something, and then they consume it. Now, we can argue that things have changed, but I'm actually going to argue that things have actually not really changed that much. We now have digital workflows and we have online authoring and we have web publishing, but that ultimately that process of write it, sort of package it and consume it hasn't really changed in 500 years. So here we are. We write the content, we format it, we publish it, we distribute it, and then our end user consumes it. So another way of looking at this would be sort of what, what's the architecture, right? What does that network diagram look like? And so over here on the left, we have content creation where authors are going in and working on the content and putting it all together and doing what they need to do. You then render it into, again, PDF, HTML, or other formats, online help formats, and you stash those rendered formats in some sort of a repository, whether it's a, a website for delivery or it's just you know a SharePoint site with a bunch of PDFs on it or whatever. And then eventually your customer comes along and they say, hey, I need that piece of information and they go get it from your repository. So they make that request and they get the information they need. Now, in content as a service, this process looks similar but not, to, not the same. We still have content creation, and I think that won't change a whole lot, especially for those of you that are already doing structured content. The things that you have to do to support structured content will go a long ways towards enabling content as a service, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is later on. So you create your content, you park it in a repository, but then the requester comes along and the requester says, hey, I need this kind of information and I want you to give it to me in this format. And at that point, when they request the content, you do the rendering and the packaging. So what's happening here is that that rendering, packaging, formatting process is being shifted over much, much later in the process to the requestor. 
So instead of having a, you know, a couple of one-way arrows and kind of a one-way process where we as authors and publishers get to write the content and then package it and control what it looks like and then deliver it, we have a case where the end user is the one that chooses what information they want, what format they want it in, and what, you know, sort of they go come to us and say, hey, give me that stuff. And then it is our job to deliver to them the information that they are asking for. So this represents a pretty fundamental shift in how we create content or the entire content life cycle, but also in how we're going to have to manage this. Because take a look at this. Over on the traditional publishing side, we have the process to write, format, publish, distribute, and consume pretty much in order. On the content as a service side, um, we write, we create, but then things get immediately kind of weird because you'll notice formatting is much later in the process. And publishing, we publish, but we're not publishing in the sense of put it all together and make it look nice in a book, but rather we're publishing these disparate, disjointed perhaps, modular pieces of information that then the customer, the consumer can choose to put together however they want. So if you look at this as an ownership issue, right? Uh, we have owners and in traditional publishing, the content creators, that's probably you and me, get a lot of control over what happens. And then the consumer at the very end gets to consume the book or the online help system or the website that we have made available to them. In content as a service, that transition from owner to consumer in terms of control happens much, much earlier. So there's an interesting shift happening here. Now, why, why do we want to do such a thing, right? We have to ask the question of what will this buy us? And there's some really interesting stuff that this can potentially buy us. For starters, this may actually allow us to address the problem of silos. And I'll talk a little bit about that next. Uh, also, content integration from disparate sources. Um, again, content duplication is something that we want to avoid, and this will help us with that. And then personalization and lightweight delivery are the other two things that I'm looking at as potential CAS um, features or things we can do with CAS. All right, so most of you know about the silo problem, right? You have a repository such as a content management system. And you have a learning management system and you have a knowledge base and you have a, a support ticketing system and you have all sorts of things. And every one of them has its own publishing workflow and its own set of deliverables. And if I'm now playing the role of the consumer, when I go in and I try to get information out of these systems, it can be extremely frustrating because I kind of have to know where to go and maybe the experience that I get from system A to system B to system B isn't consistent. We've been talking about silo busting and let's put everybody in the same authoring system so that they can just author everything together and then we can have a unified deliverable. Well, that sounds fantastic, but it hasn't worked. We've had a little bit of success in putting the tech comm people and the learning people together, but we haven't had a lot of luck with knowledge bases product information management, PIM systems, and some of these other things that are out there. So we've tried to get rid of the silos. We're not having much luck, and there's a reason for that. The component content management system, a CCMS like AEM Guides, is built to support authors who are creating technical and product content. A learning management system is built to support instructional designers and learning content developers. Those two things from the outside to the non-content person, they look really, really similar, but they do different kinds of things. And so an LMS is not a CMS, is not a KB. So we really have this issue that each system serves kind of a different purpose and is designed a little bit differently. So each silo then, each system has its own delivery pipeline, and it's really, really hard to bring those into alignment, to have a unified look and feel and unified search across these three buckets of deliverables that we're looking at here. 
And, and that's the easy problem because that's a technical problem and solving technical problems is, is hard, but not impossible. The secondary problem, the much more difficult problem we have is that people like their silos or more accurately, they like their purpose built authoring systems for the role that they play and the requirements that they have. And so actually unifying at the creator level is very, very, very difficult. So the result typically is that you're going to have ununified customer experience on the front end, on the uh, consumer end, right? The consumers are going to be looking at these different slices of information that came out of different systems and actually unifying them into something coherent can be very, very challenging. So along comes content as a service. And what we're suggesting here, so the core of content as a service is essentially that your content is API enabled. You have the ability to use some sort of an API connector to reach in and grab content from a variety of sources. And what that means for you is that you can keep your authoring silos, but unify them upon delivery. So when I, as a consumer of content, go and ask for information, the content as a service, the CAS system can combine all these things and present me with a unified uh, deliverable or a unified uh, content presentation, even if it wasn't there on the back end. So what we're talking about here is the potential to combine the technical content management system, the regular content management system, the website, the product information management or the product lifecycle management, PIM and PLM systems, your enterprise resource planning, ERP systems like SAP, your knowledge base, your CRM, your service management systems. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. So you have all this potential and you can perhaps do this without having to unify your authoring silos on the back end. As an outgrowth of this, perhaps we can look at avoiding content duplication, which, you know, we've been working on for a long time. We've done a pretty good job of this again within our silos. Uh, we do a pretty good job using technologies like DITA to leverage reuse and do programmatic reuse so that we can write a topic or a piece of information one time and then use it in lots of places. With content as a service, you can take a look at instead of copying from silo to silo to silo and then having maintenance issues, you can just combine the content at the point of delivery and um, have it there. So let's take a look at this. Your silo based solution, um, or sorry, your, your traditional solution to what we're going to do with silos would be to reduce the number of authoring systems, cross connect the silos and then use potentially use federated search on the front end, on the consumer end, to reduce uh, the delivery systems or at least mitigate the delivery systems. In content as a service, what we're gonna say is, you know what, we're not gonna really touch the authoring silos. We've tried that, it's hard. People like their specific purpose-built tools. So instead, we're gonna make the content available via an API and then combine it as requested. So I see a lot of potential here to address some of the silo issues by doing this combination later rather than sooner. On the personalization side, when we take a look at what content as a service can potentially do for us, um, we have the potential to combine the personalization that we need with some of the features that CAS offers. So first, we're going to have to think about the content itself and enriching it with the right metadata that will support personalization. This is not new and it is also not specific to CAS. We've been doing this for a while. So if you want to be able to segment based on audience as, um, you know, expert audience or user versus admin or something like that, then inside your content, you have to have metadata that supports that, that says this content is, is beginner stuff, this content is admin stuff, that type of thing. Or perhaps you have internal versus external, or you have particular chunks of information that are restricted in some way. It only goes to one customer, or you can only send it to a certain region, or you're required to send it to a certain region. And if you don't, very bad things will happen, but the content is not relevant to the other regions. So 
you personalize your content with metadata. You go through there and make sure that it has all the right tags, attributes, metadata associated with it. And then you sort of post that content up into some sort of a CAS repository, at which point it will be made available via the CAS API again. Now, the customer or the consumer is going to come into your uh, system or into your website probably, and they are either going to tell you things about themselves. You're going to ask them, do you want beginner information or advanced? Are you experienced with these kinds of things? You know, what, what, what's your previous knowledge? Or perhaps they have a login because they are a customer of yours and this is, you know, um, internal information that you share only with customers, in which case when they log in and they set up their user profile, you may know exactly what products they have purchased, what software they have licensed, what services they have access to, so you can make sure that you deliver to them the right information based on their profile. Uh, you might look at their preferred language that they've indicated and make sure that you always deliver information in that language to them. So the functional difference here is we've been able to do this previously. You can put up a site that has 10 languages on it. And then you can kind of, you do, can do some browser sniffing and this, that, and the other thing, and you can make sure that people are directed to the right place. But the difference here is that instead of putting that content up ahead of time, so putting up 10 languages and putting up a couple of different variants and having all that HTML potentially available ahead of time, what you're doing instead is when the customer comes to the site, you are then figuring out what information to give them at that point of request. You're not packaging it ahead of time into predetermined variants, which are then just on your site. Now, I know this sounds a lot like dynamic publishing, and in some ways it is. I think the biggest difference here is our focus on the idea of an API and of rendering th things through the API as opposed to whatever, you know, a dynamic publishing typically looks more like a sort of a Mad Libs approach. You know, you've got these holes and you can put things in the different holes. So now we have omnichannel delivery. Um, this is something where CAS has the potential to really help us. We have, I've talked a lot about PDF and HTML, but we have, we need to deliver content in JSON. We need to deliver uh, UI strings in a format that's compatible with the software that's being developed so that they can be dropped in there and appropriately translated localized. We have things like content on a watch or a phone or a kiosk or all these different aspect ratios, all these different formats that are supported. And we just don't know what's going to be coming along next in terms of formatting. Um, just in the last couple of years, we have things like chatbots and we have service management systems which need content and we have on device content and we just have all sorts of things, right? So if your channel, whatever it may be, supports a content API, it can then reach in and use the CAS content, which means that you can essentially just deliver it in a minimally formatted fashion and then allow processing to take place downstream that will optimize it for whatever that channel is. It means you don't have to lock in early to a particular delivery system or technology, and it means you have more flexibility down the road. Related to this, but separate, is the concept of a very lightweight delivery. And here I want to talk a little bit about the example of um, troubleshooting on a device. So let's say that you have some sort of a machine on a factory floor and it has an error code, right? It throws an error and says, hey, there's, there's a problem. Now, what happens at that point um, is in the past is that we would try and maybe put all the content on the device or perhaps the service tech is running around the factory with a tablet and they can take that error code, plug it into their tablet and figure out what's going on. But with CAS, we can look at it this way. The factory floor, the machine on the factory floor has an error code. It goes off to the service management system and the service management system says, oh, well, tell me more. Um, tell me about the voltage over here. And it can go through some troubleshooting steps and there are potentially, there's some logic and some, maybe even some AI there. You know, every time we see that error in our factory, it usually means this thing. It goes through all of that and eventually it returns, oh, okay, you have error 4566. That is a 
a battery problem, you just need to replace the battery. Here are the instructions on how to replace the battery. The, the reason I refer to this as lightweight delivery is that what we can do is we can nearly eliminate the on-device storage requirement. Um, in the past, we've, when we've tried to do this, we have put content on the machine or on the device, and we rapidly run into problems that they tend to be storage limited, and we need to deliver not just the content, but in fact, the content in multiple languages, because we don't know what language the operator of the machine is going to be using. Even if we know that the machine is being shipped, let's say, to Germany, we can't assume that the operator will want the content in German. The operator may be from another country but working in Germany, and they want it in their preferred local language or their preferred first language. Right? And we want to provide that to them because the better the operator understands the instructions, the safer it is for them to operate the machine. So we can't really make assumptions that, oh, if it goes to Germany, it just needs German. Or, oh, we'll just put English on it because everybody speaks English. That would be not so good. So, but we have these huge problems if we do ship content on device because we have to get it all on there. We have to think about localization. We run out of space and it's really hard to update, right? We have to get the content updates onto the device. So instead, what we can do, and I'll pause here and say, and this requires an internet connection to the machine, right? Which can be a huge obstacle. So if you belong to the people, the, the bucket of people whose industries don't allow for that, uh, you have air gap systems that you're not allowed to connect to the internet or to really anything else, or perhaps you have mining equipment that's um, many miles underground and there's no Wi-Fi underground, that kind of thing. I'm sorry, and we'll just we'll just set you aside for the moment. For the rest of you who have a factory with internet connectivity for the machines, which is of course more and more common these days, we can now look at eliminating or greatly reducing the on-device storage, right? Because instead of storing on the device, we're just gonna store that, hey, I have this error code, help me. And then the results might be displayed on device, but that's that's a very different can of worms, right? Because now we're only talking about a topic or two, not the entire corpus of all the information or all the error codes that you might need help for. It is also easier to update the centralized repository, again, with the prerequisite of connectivity. It is easier to update the centralized repository than it's going to be to update every single device that's out there. And then the device or the machine will make some sort of a lightweight call to the repo. So traditional diagnostic systems, it's all on the machine. We have storage capacity issues, complex updates, and languages. We've mitigated some of this with the concept of you know, a service technician and a tablet in the factory as opposed to putting it all on the machine. But in any event, we still have this big bucket of content that we need to deliver to somewhere. And with CAS, with content as a service, we are going to keep all the content in the CAS API and then just uh, push down the relevant content as it is requested. Similarly, with chatbots, we can do some stuff with CAS here, what we're going to do is we're basically going to separate the chatbot engine, the logic and the intent, from the content. We're just going to um, deliver the content into the chatbot, but we're not going to copy it in. We're just going to have links. So separate logic and content, let the engine request content from the repository and deliver the content one small chunk at a time. So in a, I hesitate to say traditional chatbot, but in a traditional chatbot, what you're going to have is a dedicated system for managing all this content, and the content will be stored in the chatbot engine itself. Whereas in CAS, we're going to separate it out and say, nope, we're going to put the content in its own place and then just retrieve content from the CAS system or the CAS repository. So why is this important? You know, looking at this as a systems person and as somebody that builds systems and configures things and tries to move um, content authoring and content development workflows forward, why does this matter? Well, the big things are that we are going to be able to defer processing, 
provide for lightweight delivery and consumer choice in terms of what kind of content they get and potentially combine data sources or content sources without doing unified authoring. So these are kind of, these are the big things that I see that give CAS such potential and I think make it so important. When you publish, what you're essentially doing is packaging up your information and uh, predetermining the, the, end, the final result that your customer is going to get. So it's a little like baking. You put it all together and you cover it with this wonderful chocolate sauce and uh, you put it all together and there you are. And as a consumer, you get to pick, but you kind of have a menu to pick from. You have a limited set of choices to pick from. With CAS and content on demand, what we're looking at is that the publisher doesn't necessarily control those endpoints, and instead the consumer gets to control them. The publisher makes the content available and the consumer chooses what they want. Now, it's worth pointing out here that you could, of course, uh, create an endpoint and you could be the person creating that delivery endpoint. So you're not necessarily ceding 100% of your control to your customer, um, but, this idea that we're going to put the content in an API and then there's all sorts of interesting downstream processing that could happen to it after we let it go is uh, a little troubling, actually. Interesting, but a little troubling. So what do you need? Um, if you're going to have CAS, what are your content requirements? Well, these look an awful lot like structured content, right? You want modular content, you need individual steps that you can reach in and grab, you need individual error messages with their troubleshooting, you need metadata, you need to be able to address a particular piece of content, you need labels, you need categories, you need formatting hooks, but not formatting, and you really cannot operate in large, you know, chapter size blobs of content that is not going to work. So this looks to me an awful lot like the requirements that we identify for DITA and for modular structured content. So if you have that already, you're probably ahead of the game here. CAS is going to give you potentially um, a way for your consumers to control what they're requesting, a way to integrate content with data sources, and a way to separate out your content from the non-content repositories. Now, there are some challenges I should probably point out. Um, this further separation of content and formatting is going to be painful for those of us who care about content and formatting. There's going to be a lot of configuration effort, and there's going to be a requirement to align across your functional groups and get people talking to each other. That's going to be a huge issue. And for this last one, how granular, you know, how small is too small? How small can your content get before it becomes just unmaintainable and uncontrollable? I'd also like to point out that it's not going to be cheap. Um, the commercial tools have the great advantage that they are commercial tools and somebody's thought about, oh, you're going to need formatting like this, or, oh, you're going to need these kinds of things. CAS is wide open and has a ton of flexibility, but that comes with configuration effort and cost. And then sitting in the middle here, I have frameworks, which would be typically something like DITA, DITA Open Toolkit, database publishing, where there's a framework in place, but you still have to do quite a lot of work. So... This is a choice that you're going to make, which one of these you need or want, and the answer will be different for different people amongst you. So I believe, based on all of this, that CAS is probably going to be the future of publishing. And I guess the better question is, are you ready for this? Is your content ready? Do you have a strategy to move through this and figure out what you're going to do? So I'll leave you with that question, and thank you very much for coming today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.